Hey all, Alex from Music Hub here, and today we'll be checking in on the literature deep dive with the ranking of the novels by Jane Austen. English author Jane Austen, born 16th of December 1775 in Steventon, Hampshire, died the 18th of July 1817 in Winchester, Hampshire. I hadn't actually read a Jane Austen book before this, but I mean, it's impossible to get away from her influence, so of course I knew her quite greatly. She's probably the first great 20th century novelist um, at a time when many of the greatest literary minds were in the genre of poetry, it's, um, thinking of like Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth. Uh, Austen's immense success as a novelist was instrumental not only in legitimizing the novel as a genre, but in legitimizing the idea of the female author. Uh, her satirical portraits of English culture, social stratification, femininity, marriage were radical for the era, and I don't pretend to have read a lot of other English novels from this time, so I'm not the most, the biggest expert in making that comparison, but from what I've read, the difference is noticeable and even staggering, if you will. So I want to say right off the bat uh, if you've tried to read Jane Austen before and you've struggled because it seems so old-fashioned and boring, uh, the context is incredibly helpful, or certainly it was for me. I'm going to be ranking the six standard published novels from her oeuvre. Uh, I'll not be including any of her unfinished works. Uh, and while I won't officially rank it, I do want to mention the 1794 novel Lady Susan, although it was not published until 1871. It's a complete, albeit brief, epistolary novel that is uh, a novel written in the form of letters from one character to another. The central character, Lady Susan, is actually the villain of the story, which I thought was interesting. This very manipulative person, recently widowed, who acts as a seductress in order to finance her extravagant lifestyle. I didn't feel like there was much of a resolution to the story. It felt more like a singular excerpt, just one example of the wild life that she lives. But I thought her character was quite interesting and kind of out of left field compared to other Austen characters, even other Jane Austen villains. It reminds me ever so slightly of uh, Daniel Defoe's Maul Flanders, but not quite as fully explored or developed as the Maul Flanders character was. Interesting read, uh, but only really is a postscript to the rest of Austin's catalog. So that leaves us with the main six, the big six. And at number six, I am going with 1814's Mansfield Park. This is the only Jane Austen novel that I was uh, kind of lukewarm on, which probably shouldn't have been surprising as this is considered her most controversial novel. A lot of the controversy stems around how Austen handles the issues of servitude and slavery in this book, and I certainly wouldn't say she sounds like a fervent abolitionist, per se, but I also don't think she's entirely uncritical of the issue either, and she does use the main character of Fanny Price to inquire about the slave trade and her uncle's kind of implied participation in it. On the topic of Fanny Price, though, I'm in agreement with the criticisms of her as a main character. She's bland, painfully so, actually, and for being someone outside of the elite social classes, she actually does align with them on a great many things, even if I give her credit for questioning the whole slavery issue. There's a whole section about the morality of the theater, which uh, had some cultural relevance that back then, because it was something that was considered to be in question, uh, but now it just comes off as a bit of a painful drag, and I don't come away entirely convinced of whether Austen views the stage as immoral or not. Couple all this with an ending that feels kind of rushed and unearned, and it just didn't leave a great taste in my mouth, uh, undeniably the most difficult of her novels to get through. Number five is the 1815 novel Emma, which uh, I know has a great deal of devoted fans among the literary community. And I think the reason why it's lower on the list for me is mostly a matter of immediacy. Uh, this one didn't knock my proverbial socks off. 
in quite the same way as the top four did. But rather, it just kind of feels like a slow burn and one I'll have to reread for uh, it to grow on me a little bit more. But I do expect it to grow, and I did still really like it. Um, the main character of Emma Woodhouse is so obviously flawed and makes so many mistakes that her interactions with Mr. Knightley are pleasing um, because he'll actually hold her accountable for her actions. Uh, my favorite of the characters is probably Harriet Smith, though. Maybe she's a little flat, doesn't really develop too much, but her naivete is pleasant in a way that Emma's isn't. And for the most part, you just kind of feel bad for her because she's consistently one of the biggest victims of the mistakes that Emma makes. Perhaps part of the reason why this isn't as high for me is also because of the sheer amount of characters that come and go. This whole novel is meant to portray the dynamics of a whole town, so the misters and misses tend to blend together at times, and I did have a bit of a difficult time keeping track of them all, uh, though that might be just uh, my own personal shortcomings as a reader there, so full disclosure on that front. But again, I think revisiting this novel will be very beneficial, and I certainly like it a great deal now, and will probably like it more as time goes on. Number four is Austin's 1811 debut novel, Sense and Sensibility. I think the character dynamics in this novel are terrific, and I love the relationship of the two Dashwood sisters, who are sort of pitted against each other just by virtue of the book's title, but actually end up supporting one another uh, more often than not. And even though, in some ways, I could see this book being the most sympathetic to Eleanor's reserved nature, as opposed to Marianne's outgoing personality, uh, I don't think the book ultimately draws a conclusion as far as which one is preferable between the two. It's hard to say if that was uh, an intentional choice, especially since Austin apparently wanted Eleanor to be the clear protagonist, but then had second thoughts midway through the writing process. Uh, but I think that uncertainty is brilliant and just contributes to the impact of the novel overall. Colonel Brandon is one of Austin's best secondary characters, and his tentative kind of back and forth with Marianne contrasts nicely with the more emotionally tense back and forth between Eleanor and Edward Ferrars. It's little wonder this novel has translated especially well to the uh, silver screen. Uh, excellent stuff overall. Great book. At number three... I am going with the first of her two posthumous books, Northanger Abbey, which she first wrote back in 1803, wasn't published until 1818. It was her first completed work, and it really feels like it, but not because of the lack of quality. No, this novel is fun as hell, and what I appreciate most about it is its unbridled, unhindered display of Jane Austen's love for books. The extended sections where main character Catherine Moreland and her love interest Henry Tilney kind of wax poetic on the merits of different novels of the day are so joyous, so fun. And the novel's popularity actually caused some of these novels to be reprinted in the 20th century after decades, if not centuries, of obscurity, uh, which might be the best part of it all. The whole novel is a sort of gothic parody with a main character so obsessed with the genre of gothic novels uh, that she tries to impart those plot points onto, uh, onto her everyday life, which um, generally goes awry, as many of these chaotic plots do. And yes, there is a definite Cervantes influence at points here. It's a romp. It's on the briefer side as far as her novels go, but apart from another ending that seems a little all over the place at times, uh, it's really fun, quite hilarious at times, and the characters are among the most likable of Austin's career. I had a lot of fun reading this book. Number two is the other posthumous novel, Persuasion, the last novel that she wrote before her death. This one is the exact opposite of Northanger Abbey. It is dark, moody, and the circumstances surrounding the plot are sad in a way that other Austen novels really aren't. And Elliot, having rejected the marriage proposal of one Captain Wentworth some years prior, finds herself in company with that same Captain Wentworth again. And while she regrets the decision to reject that proposal, he isn't ready to forgive her for it. At least, not yet. 
This isn't a romance novel where sheer fortunate circumstance brings the two together. Uh, it's shared hardship and stressful situations that do. The near death of one of the secondary characters, Louisa, is especially important, and it's probably the most intense scene in any Austen novel, honestly. I don't think darkness necessarily equates maturity, so to speak, but there's no doubt that this novel rejects the cheek and quirkiness of other Austen works. It's a social analysis for more than just amusement's sake, and to some extent the melancholy might reflect Austen's own state of being, uh, approaching 40 years of age in somewhat declining health. Most of the characters are pretty respectable individuals, especially the secondary characters like the Musgroves and the Crofts, or uh, Captain Benwick, another character I really liked, all of whom have been matured in their own ways by their own lived experiences and thus feel more relatable to some degree. It's a bit of a downer of a book overall, even with the happy ending. Spoiler alert. Um, but it does make you wonder what directions Austin would have wanted to explore had she lived longer. And at number one, we have Pride and Prejudice from 1813. A lot of Austen's other novels have kind of steadily grown in popularity as her renown has increased, but this novel has been a smash hit pretty much ever since it hit the printing presses for the first time, and it's not hard to see why at all. Miss Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy are a pair of fascinating, easy to like, but clearly flawed protagonists, intertwined in this dance where, as much as he'd like to say that, you know they're going to end up together, and they're meant for each other, uh, you're constantly left questioning yourself, asking if uh, this time was just one separation too many. And make no mistake, this book is about the main characters. The supporting characters support the main plot point without kind of confusing it with these extraneous storylines. A clear hierarchy that... Uh, in my view, anyways, is the key to making a romance novel work effectively. Provided, of course, you have the main characters to back that up, which Pride and Prejudice has in spades. All of their actions are understandable once the full context is slowly revealed in the final chapters, and the reveal of that context, uh, which comes mainly in the form of letters to Elizabeth, is remarkably powerful. Even the moments that feel less grounded, more idealistic are perfectly digestible. Uh, the fairy tale aura is fine by me in this context. I know others complain about it, but I'm fine with it. And I certainly wouldn't have the novel end any other way. And like Sense and Sensibility, the amount of film or television adaptations that this novel has inspired, bad and good alike, is also something to be grateful for, at least in my eyes. So that's it, folks. I hope you found this video interesting, and as I continue to go through these deep dives, I will continue to do more of these videos. Now, I want to address this just kind of off the bat. Um, this channel is called Music Hub for a reason, and we will be focusing much more on music, specifically once we get to the recorded era. However, I do think it would be a missed opportunity if I didn't continue to document these things that I'm reading uh, absorbing, um, just for overall context, um, in order to get to this point, I felt like, um, it would really be a disservice if I was to just kind of disregard that and not talk about them at all. Links to my music writing are going to be in the description below. More videos to come in the near future. Thanks for watching and yeah, have a good one.